Thank you so much, and I am blushing now um, from that very kind introduction. And so excited uh, to be with everybody here today. Um, thank you for taking time out on a Friday afternoon, because uh, I know we've all got lots of things to do to get ready for this semester. And uh, um, I want to appreciate letting me little, spend a little time with you. Um, I am I'm just trying to get this to, oh, there we go. Uh, I'm uh, the assistant professor and also the assistant dean at Lees McCray College in Banner Elk, North Carolina. So my picture behind me there is off my back deck, uh, looking at my mountains where I'm going. So I live in a very privileged place to be and uh, very much enjoy living up here in Western North Carolina. So we're, I'm also a Red Cross nurse. So we're waiting to get ready for, it looks like a, a category one that's gonna be hitting the Eastern seaboard of North Carolina. So I'm also waiting to see what's gonna be happening with that. Um, presentation today is gonna to be looking at how we start thinking outside the box. And now I teach in a small college, but when I went to nursing school at University of Toronto in Canada, um, I was in a class of 167 and my faculty there gave me an awful lot of role modeling to do about how we start engaging our students, um, even in very large classes. So as I put together this presentation, I was really trying to make sure that the information that I was providing and the ideas that I'm giving you can be applicable to any size of classroom. It's just going to begin thinking a little bit outside the box sometimes of how we manage to engage our students. Um, I just want to start with a bit of a disclaimer here because I am going to be mentioning various products, but I have not received any reimbursement um, by any organization or individual for any of the topics. I just wanted to give you some ideas of places where you can be going in order to be able to find resources that you can use with your students. So I just want to make sure you understand that no one is giving me any money um, for advertising any particular product at all. This is going to be an engaged session because I can't preach about doing active learning if I don't practice active learning. So we are going to have a couple of breakout sessions in this group and I do hope that you will engage in those sessions and, and uh, learn from each other and strategize different ideas of how you can engage your students and not drop off. Um, but if you do have to get off for a reason and uh, you uh, would like to get more information or get my full presentation, please feel reach out to Alex afterwards. And um, I'm happy he's got a copy of it and he's happy to be able to share it with you. So our plan for this session is, is we're, gonna, we're gonna start by looking at the necessity to engage students in active learning and uh, the types of active strategies. So I'm gonna be talking to a variety of different, give you guys different kinds of ideas of things that can be done in the classroom. Then we're going to be going into a breakout room and uh, planning a class um, using some of these active learning strategies. Then we'll come back again uh, and talk about clinical because that is where I know we are most of us and anytime I've been talking to faculty uh, friends who are all over the country, that's the first they're saying is, what are you doing about clinical? How are you handling clinical? Because that is the bane of our, I think of all of our lives right now. And, um, I had another meeting this morning trying to arrange for clinical. I'm a community health nurse and that's how our students graduated last year is because my clinical is a precepted clinical. And so we're gaming on that. This may be the way that they're going to graduate this year. So the, the stress is on me right now in order to be able to make sure I've got a really good 120 clinical hours as per the North Carolina Board of Nursing requirements uh, so for them to be able to graduate next year. So the, the pressure is on. Um, so I want to talk about different things that we can do to start thinking outside the acute care to get those, those precious um, experiential learning opportunities. And then again, we're going to give you some breakout time and start thinking about uh, for a gerontology or a pediatric clinical rotation, what kind of community resources can you start using where you can place students um, in a precepted or maybe in some group session work in order for them to be able to get those clinical hours. I want to finish it off by talking about debriefing because uh, if we're going to be trying to make sure that the work that we're doing to gauge those students is working, the only way we can find that out is by doing a debriefing. So we're going to spend a little bit of time talking about some strategies in a variety of, of both a didactic, clinical, and simulation, including virtual simulation, um, how we're going to be able to get some ideas about doing that. And then we'll close out and answer any questions that you may have. So the learning objectives that I've got for you guys today, one, that you can explain what's important to use active learning strategies, uh, how are uh, different kinds of active strategies that you can use to engage students in a class, no matter the size, how can you rethink community resources to become precepted clinical opportunities, 
And then finally, can you create uh, student debriefing opportunities in all learning environments using a variety of different methods? So active learning, I mean, we've all keep hearing about this, but why in the heck is this important to us as nurse educators? So what are the pros? Well, right now we know that uh, for many students, um, including non-traditional students, they're coming into our nursing programs without the skills and have had previous opportunities to learn how to extract data and information and start putting it together uh, to come to conclusions. And as the focus now moves, uh, especially with NCLEX Next Gen, um, and now Patricia Benner's work in terms of transforming nursing education, we really need to be able to engage students into their learning processes. Um, this is a challenge for them because if we don't guide them into learning to develop this critical thinking, they're not able to walk into that very complex patient care situations and being able to deliver um, that critical knowledge and then clinical judgment and then we've got uh, failure to rescue issues and significant medical uh, um, medication errors and so forth that we see with a lot of our, our brand new grads. So this is on, on nurse educators in order to be able to start moving and getting away from the uh, stage on the gate, um, the uh, sage on the stage and towards the, the guide on the side and help students in order to be able to apply all of these concepts uh, that we are so working so hard in order to be able to teach them. So these are where the pros are. So student engagement, uh, and this is all from the literature, recent literature that student engagement is leading to higher improved achievement. Uh, we're seeing that students are able to develop critical thinking and problem solving skills. Getting that pre-work, their students are coming prepared to class to, to be able to apply that new information. Um, and as we've talked about earlier here, the, these Generation Z students have not developed those strategies to be able to learn how to come to conclusions, but they do like being involved in and working with each other to be involved in their learning. Well, what are the cons? Well, the biggest challenge that we have found out, especially from when we had to move everything online from COVID, is that this may not be intuitive. Learning how to be able to teach online is not intuitive. Um, learning how to be able to create active learning strategies is not necessarily intuitive and some faculty may require um, some additional hand holding themselves in order to be able to overcome the resistance and move towards this. Um, I started the process of moving our faculty over into flipped classrooms three years ago and it started out by taking them through Patricia Benner's uh, book and we would have a monthly journal club and I would give them homework. Um, based upon the different chapters of that to come back and talk about well, what would that look like then? What does this mean to nursing education? And what would we need to do as a school of nursing in order to be able to uh, address the, the, um, the challenges and, and the, um, I think the, the encouragement that uh, these forward thinking nurse educators have given to the rest of us to be able to start addressing and teaching in a different way. Um, but the next year then, uh, I started role modeling it. So I took my community health class and I completely flipped it. And I asked the faculty to come in and see my, sit in my class and see what I was doing and then sit with me afterwards and talk to me, what did they see that was different from the class that they were doing? And did they, what did they see in terms of student engagement and how are they seeing students uh, actually learning what they needed to learn and applying what they needed to uh, apply to become safe and effective practitioners. And these are senior nursing students that I have in my class. So um, they were seeing how this was gonna benefit the students preparing to be able to pass NCLEX and be um, novice practitioners. So this last year, they all had to flip their classrooms. And uh, it was again a challenge. We did, I did a lot of work with them in order to be able to help them create their learning plans. Um, but we are, the Dean has already said that regardless of whether we're in person or whether we're going to be online, she wants that classroom to be flipped in some way or another. So I've been working an awful lot with faculty again to have active learning strategies that they can use in the online environment. And that's where a lot of the information I'm gonna be giving you today can be used in a variety of different formats. Um, and I was trying to be very purposeful of that in order to be able to give you a lot of things to walk away with from today. So it does create some extra preparation work for the faculty. Um, you do want to be able to have your champions um, who are going to take the initiative and demonstrate how this is going to work. You're going to be able to try and overcome a lot of the resistance that you're going to have amongst faculty, especially who are very comfortable in teaching in a lecture format, because that's what they've always done. 
Um, students, are, again, are used to being uh, in their first couple of years before they come into our program. They're being taught to a test. They sit there and they lecture, they go home and memorize, and then they brain dump. And that does not work, as we know, uh, for, for to create safe nurses. Uh, so they had given a little bit of pushback in their first semester um, because they're not used to this. And we have to help them understand how this is going to help them learn and be successful in meeting um, the course uh, uh, cutoff for grades and being able to progress into the next semester. And sometimes faculty are limited in the amount of material you can present in class. So again, it takes a lot of being very purposeful in developing my uh, online lectures that they as pre-work that they have to do. And then what I get them to, I determine again, what are the, the needs to know that they must have in terms of information. And I'll give them a, a, maybe a brief half an hour just to answer any questions that came out of the online work that they had to do. And then I put them right into active learning strategies in class and then we debrief at the end of the class. So the future of nursing really is going to require moving us away from the traditional lecture and we have to guide these students to be able to learn to take concepts, extract data, and develop those clinical judgment. NCLEX Next Gen is pushing us, especially in order to be able to develop these active learning strategies and it is going to be evaluating the ability of students to evaluate. And if we don't get them practicing that in class and seeing that, that and having that opportunity to be able to think things through, then they're not, they're going to have a more difficult time when it comes to this new um, type of, of um, clinical judgment expectations for the next gen. By utilizing active learning strategies, we're, they're getting immediate feedback. They're not doing a lecture and then waiting for the feedback to come when they do not do well on an exam or a written assignment. So having that immediate feedback again too is letting students know where they may need to go back and do some remediation or some additional studies in order to be able to close any knowledge gaps or work with faculty or remediation um, experts on that you have in your team. And students have enhanced learning and they do perform better on examinations as demonstrated in the literature. So what can you use? So what I'm going to work on to this with you this afternoon is we're going to talk about a variety of different strategies and you're going to take these uh, stra different strategies into the break first breakout session and plan a class. So um, take any notes or if you've got any questions about it, uh, shoot them towards Alex because he'll be able to help me um, organize you a little bit as you're thinking about this in your breakout sessions. When we're looking at the lecture format and the flip glass format, there's a couple, a few things that are shared by both. One, students should have some kind of pre-class work. In the lecture format, it's they've got a reading activity. In the flip class format, they've got a video or I do a uh, voiceover PowerPoint. I'll give them videos. I will send them for quizzes. Um, I will sometimes find different little activities that I want them to do to be able to try and start applying some of that information. If they're doing um, different types of activities in class where they'll be using that. Uh, we've got our principal class time, again, in the for lecture format, that's what you're getting, the students are getting, they're getting a lecture. In my flip class, I do, I use Mentimeter, which is the um, audience response system. There's like Kahoot as well, too. We do lots of case studies. Um, I have them doing practicing um, with different types of um, uh, role playing when we can not having to do social distancing. So I'm trying to figure out how I'm doing some role playing with social distancing this semester. So there's a variety of different things, but you're actually getting them involved and practicing and playing with the information that you want them to learn. Um, you can again share by both. We can be using the audience response systems in the lecture format. It may be breaking the breaking the topics down and, and having some questions throughout. Um, Frequently, I'm doing a quiz at the beginning of the semester or the beginning of the class with the uh, with the class and then I'm also quite frequently doing questions at the end. And I usually do an awful lot of select all and apply or extend a multiple response because I want to make sure they've got lots of opportunities to practice answering those questions. So this is a great opportunity for me to be able to uh, let, help them figure out how to read those questions, break them apart and understand how they pick multiple answers for a question. And then again, shared by both, you'll be doing a case activity. Activity. Um, frequently mine are doing it in teams. They can be doing soap notes. I frequently will have them do an S bar. Uh, can be a class discussion. And those can, formats can also be used in the lecture format. So here's some pre-working le learning strategies. And when I was doing research for this 
several years ago, uh, and I also was then pulling some new stuff because I wanted to see what was the latest stuff out there in preparing for this presentation. Uh, Pillshare has come out with, with a brand new article in the Journal of Continuing Education. And so I took a lot of her concepts as well as things that I, and added to that to my list to my own things that I do. And uh, so that way then we can, you can get some ideas of different kinds of learning strategies. Um, blogs or wiki posts are a great way to get students to start exploring and, and responding to each other on these topics. Um, concept mapping, I love concept mapping because it really helps them to be able to break things down, um, can give them some hint sheets. Again, I use a lot of videos as well too to get students to be able to go and explore a topic area and then we come back and we set up debates on various areas or we can have a class discussion. Mystery diagnosis is another one that I'm using. I'm using this as, um, um, but in a different format. What mystery diagnosis is, is I give uh, a bunch of pictures. So for example, um, I might give a picture of a bag of a uh, thousand mils of normal saline and a, a suction pump and uh, NG tube, IV tubing. Uh, I might have some different kinds of medications and I'll get the store, the students to sit down and put those, take those pictures and have to put together a, uh, uh, a story. What do they think this client has? What's the, what would be the diagnosis that they would be doing and come up with um, three different nursing diagnoses that you would have for this. And so it's a great way because they might have the same tools, but they might come up with different ideas, but it allows them then to see some of the concepts that are all gonna be going across those different types, different diagnoses. Um, I'm gonna be using mine because, uh, this way in terms of I've given them several pages of pictures of different kinds of food, because normally I have them playing with my plastic food in order to be able to create uh, meals for different types of chronic disease. And they've got to be able to talk about um, if you've got your, your chronic heart failure patient, what would be the uh, fluid restrictions? How would you help the client understand what kind of, what's considered a fluid? Um, how much salt would they be taking? How would they be looking at teaching how to use a, read a, a, a label such as Pfizer's um, uh, newest vital sign. So I get them to use that and they've got to be able to then take those pictures and put together a meal uh, for a day. They've got to go to breakfast, a lunch, a dinner, uh, and a snack for this client and talk about what would be the, uh, the education they'd be giving this client and how is it going to meet the nutritional requirements of that client. And that's going to be a ticket to class for them when they were doing chronic disease this semester. So there's different kinds of things you can be doing with that. And again, it just helps the students to start critically thinking about what they're seeing and how it's being used. Different kinds of online modules that, that people can do. Again, there's a lot of different um, publishers uh, materials that can be utilized uh, as reviews in order to be able to get prepared students prepared to come in. We use Evolve and um, uh, F.A. Davis a lot in order to be able for some of these online modules that are assigned as pre-work. Get, of course, our reading materials. Um, again, I do le recorded lectures. Self-assessments. My students have to do a lot of self-assessments and looking at uh, um, cultural competencies and uh, doing uh, biases, especially when it comes to uh, race and um, uh, ethnicities, religious, uh, in order for them to be able to capture uh, and we have, we have some very frank discussions about labeling people and what does that mean to your role as a nurse in order to be able to provide uh, client-centered care. Uh, worksheets, lots of questions and quizzes, um, video demonstrations, again, too, if you're looking at skills. Virtual simulations are another great way. A lot of virtual simulations can be very Quite, actually quite short uh, that they could be doing again, then you're coming back in and breaking down what did they learn, what were the challenges that they had, scavenger hunts and escape routes uh, are gr another great opportunity for students to have to be able to work their way to answer questions before they can move into the next section and there's a variety of different um, uh, tools out there to be able to show you how to be able to create your own escape rooms. And then in the classroom, again, the variety of different things that we could be utilizing. Um, again, my audience response systems, I use that a lot. Actually, I use it every day in class because uh, the students really like having the extra questions to practice on. Um, I do a lot of case studies and unfolding case studies, and I have students where they reach the end of the unfolding case study, especially when I do one with my families, and they go, but, but what happened to them? I want to know what happened to them. So it's, they can get very involved with what's going on if they're written well. So again, it's another great way of getting the students really 
uh, engage with the work, compare and contrast work, concept mapping. Um, I get my students to create a lot of client education handouts because that's having to use the evidence-based practice. They're having to use, learn on how to be able to frame materials that's co culturally competent way, also meeting um, uh, uh, education levels. I'm in rural Appalachia. We have a, our older population primarily do not even have a high school diploma. So I've got to get students to work on how they are going to be able to create education handouts at a grade five reading level. And that's a real challenge for them, but they learn a lot about how to be able to frame information to clients then in very simple concepts, which makes it easier for, this, for the clients to understand why they're taking medications and be more adherent to treatment recommendations. A gallery walk is where you could be setting up items or pictures. Um, around a room and then have students go and take a look at that and then they again they, they've got to be able to start trying to put together the puzzle of what um, they may be seeing as the breakdown of uh, a client prognosis and various nursing interventions that you need to do. Games, my students love it when I put Jeopardy in the classroom. I, I love Ponder, they love Ponder. And again, that is another board game that is created by a nurse. And uh, you've got cards with different symptoms. They've got dice, which they gives them all of their vital signs. It's got good medications, it's got changes in their status. And it really, really drives a lot of the critical thinking. And they love doing that in class because they are having to try and figure out, plus they're playing against each other. So they like to get a little competitive at times. Um, we've talked about the mystery disease, the client drug, um, peer discussions, peer evaluations. Um, I find I use a lot of photo elicitation because they really struggle sometimes with understanding how to do a really good general survey. So I will frequently just be throwing a photograph up and, and asking students, what do you see? How are you, what do you see about the skin? Um, what does the client's um, look like? Does he look like he's got changes due to possibly this? I might then say, okay, well, here's a little bit about a clinical history. Now go back and look at that photo value uh, again and tell me now what do you see? So again, it's trying to get them to train their eyes um, so that when they're seeing that client for the first time or they're walking into that room, they know how to start looking at the client and evaluating. Uh, does they look like they're in pain? Um, and what is their coloring looking like? So it's just starting to try and get them to be able to start looking and using those nursing senses. Problem-based learning, again, to another big one that I use in class. Um, they can be, again, working in groups with this. Um, frequently, we'll just get them to do it individually so that they're starting to start putting things together. Quizzes, question and answer sessions, role playing, simulation. Um, we uh, use an, a simulated EHR and frequently we'll pull, pull a case and we'll go through that in class where they're actually having to document um, as we're working through a case study, they've also, also documenting their nursing diagnosis and interventions. Um, we, we have a system where we can uh, change the, the case in, and add new labs on. And so now that they, they've got to be able to now deal with new labs and what does that change in terms of their, their nursing interventions or what else should they be looking for? Or how is this going to change their assessment? So again, too, it's, it's trying to give them some real life type of ideas in order for them to be able to then incorporate those concepts that we're learning in class today. Um, storyboards is another fun way where they are given a, a, a concept and or maybe a, a brief introduction to a scenario and then they've got to draw out um, what's going to happen with this case. So it may be that uh, the client um, has been now sent home post-stroke and um, the, the caregiver is elderly and um, is, wants, the per wants their spouse home but is uncertain about their ability in order to be able to provide care and so they're very fearful and, and talking to the nurse before discharge. But what does that look like in the storyboard in terms of therapeutic communication with that client? How, how are the nurses working in order to be able to ensure safe discharge for this client and this family? So they can draw these out and they really enjoy the idea of just putting together like a picture book of that, those kind of concepts. Um, I use a lot of videos in class. I might get them searching, especially when we're working on um, doing data mining, doing web quests in order to be able to go and find what would be appropriate information or maybe why do numbers differentiate when you're looking at uh, demographics for a certain county when they're doing their community um, health assessment. Um, and then the what if is great is a great thing where you can be starting, here's a particular case study. Now, what if this happens? 
And what if this happens? And how does this change in terms of the nursing practice? So these are all things that can be done on with a variety of number of students and in a variety of different ways. And so I wanted to make sure I was giving you guys some opportunities of thinking about uh, how you can be introducing these into the classroom. Classroom assessment techniques uh, is another big thing that I really ask my faculty to include. And um, this is a great way, it's a formative evaluation, it's not graded, but it sure as heck helped me understand that I meet the mark in order to be able to help st uh, these students get the information that I wanted them to walk out with today. And so if you, if you haven't heard of classroom assessment techniques in the past, or, or CATS as, as we usually call them, they're a simple, anonymous, uh, formative evaluation of class activities that are, give the students the opportunity to reflect on what they've learned today. And for you as the faculty member, some feedback on the success of the teaching learning activity that you did with them. So there are a variety of different ones that I'm, I put down the ones that I, I really like to use in class just to give you guys some ideas of how you can do this. And there are several books out there on nothing but classroom assessment techniques. So if you wanna learn more about this, um, you can look for some uh, evidence-based practice articles as well as look for these, for these books um, to give you some ideas of how to utilize these techniques. So the minute paper is usually, I think probably one of the most frequently used um, CAT. And this is where students are gonna answer um, maybe one or two questions uh, max, because uh, this is only just gonna take a minute. So what was the most important thing that you learned today in class? Or what's the most important question that was not answered? And that as a faculty, you wanna know so that you might just review some of those ideas or put a short note up in order to be able to answer some of those questions as an announcement in class. Um, but this is gonna just help you get to, did I make the mark of where I want these students to be after the end of today? The muddiest point, um, this can be, again, the simplest one, but this is really probably, I would only use this for my junior students, my incoming students, because this is not really getting them to think on a higher level um, as we're looking at the analysis and the application component of it. This is more of a knowledge base is that, well, what's the muddiest point? What was the part that I really just did not understand today? And, uh, but it's not gonna be applicable when you're thinking about integration and synthesis. So keep this for your, your incoming students. What the concept is, is that where students will take a concept or concepts um, to solve a problem of various types. So if I'm saying, okay, well, we've now talked about um, chronic heart failure today. I want you to tell me what are the concepts that you learned about today and, and give me one point about that concept as a nursing intervention. And so again, this is just in order to be able to help them go back and reflect because the reflection is always a good thing in nursing, um, what, what they learned today and make sure that they did get those points. And if you're not seeing those points come across again too, this is my cue that I need to just, let's go back and just talk about a few things here. So I need to make sure you guys understand this before we move forward to, to the rest of the day's work. The defining uh, features matrix, this is where students can categorize concepts according to the presence or absence of important defining features. So this is part like where is this going to be, um, uh, this is a, a required, is this is a contraindicated, or is this the not necessary? And that is a very much an incoming NCLEX type of question. So this, I really like using this now because this is again starting to get these students to be able to start determining the pri and prioritization of different types of activity of um, interventions or or client symptoms or um, diagnostics or things that are there that they're demonstrating so uh, another great tool to be able to use and help faculty again to start thinking about how they're going to design questions like that in preparation for students writing N uh, NGN in another couple of years focus listing is getting the students attention on a single important um, item or concept from the lesson and again is redirecting the students to list ideas related to that particular focus topic area. Categorizing grid is where students will complete a grid on three or four overarching concepts and a variety of subordinate elements. So you may have, let's say we're going to talk about three different types of concepts. Now tell me similarities and symptoms that you might see for all three of these and tell me how you'd be able to identify that it's going to be back towards this particular uh, diagnosis. So again too, it's trying to get the students to not, because they're very linear, you're, you know, you have metabolic acidosis that's for diabetes. Okay, well, we can have metabolic acidosis for a lot of other things besides diabetes. So it's trying to get them beyond that linear 
component of it and start making connections between different disease categories to help them think and critically think and, and assess um, that client. The RSQC2, which stands for Recall, Summarize, Question, Connect, and Comment. And this is where students are going to write a brief statement um, uh, that recall, summarize, question, connect, and comment on meaningful points from the previous lecture. So you're going to go back and say, okay, now what did you learn about last week? Because we're going to be building on that this week. So it's a great way just to start, even start a class then, in order to be able to make sure that they are paying attention and they're taking what you taught last week and starting to build it into their memory bank so that they're going to be using it going forward. Content form and function outlines. Um, this again, outline form, they can analyze the what, which is the content, the how, which is the form, and the why is the function. And I use this a lot for medications um, or nursing interventions. Um, medications primarily is what I use it for because we do a lot of medications in my community health class. Application cards, uh, students generate examples of real life applications for concepts, nursing interventions, or medications. So again, another way if you've been talking about, um, say, we're going to be doing our antipsychotics, uh, talk to me again too about how you're going, to, how would you apply this in real life? What kind of client would you be seeing that we would be seeing that medication being ordered for, and how would you educate that client? Um, just you know, a few points that I want them to be able to demonstrate that they've gotten the essence of that medication. And then student generated test questions. And um, they like this because they are always trying to see if this question is actually going to end up on the exam. But again, they're having to really think about how to be able to write a test question. What are, what are the key points? And um, if they know if it's going to be on an exam, it's going to have to be tricky. So they're going to really be thinking about what are the different ways that they can uh, uh, get in the evidence based practice and write it in such a way that. Um, uh, their, their classmates not, may not get the answer correct. And so I always give them a little bit of an education of how to write a test question first, just to be able to make sure that the questions that they're thinking about have um, a, a format to them that would meet uh, what we expect and what they would normally see on exams. So that's how you're getting some different kinds of CAT ideas that you can be actually utilizing in, in the classroom. And again, I, I strongly encourage faculty to be able to do this. Uh, simply because it's going to give you a lot more feedback about where they're at and knowing what, um, where we, where we may be falling on or how do you mean you need to change an activity for future classes. So we're going to take a little bit of time and have a breakout session. And as uh, you move into your group, um, this is your scenario. You are a faculty group that's organizing a class on chronic kidney disease. So using any of the resources that were presented to you, or if you have some that you have used that you have found very successful, please share um, that you can use to engage students in this content for a 90 minute class. And I want you to include a classroom assessment technique that's going to evaluate whether the students understood the concepts that they were learning about. So Alex, I will ask if you guys can put the, everybody into breakout sessions and we'll be, give you guys about 15 minutes to be able to sit down and work together to come up with your 90 minute class. Great, so uh, my colleague Vasanti is uh, taking care of that. Uh, Terry, I have a quick question for you before we jump okay. in. Uh, Lori Zach asked, do you give credit or points for completion of pre-work or preparation for class? So no, this, this is so that they can actually learn what to do to be prepared to participate in class. So again, it's, it's just like anything else. You, you're you're going to come to class and really get a lot out of it, then you need to do the pre-work. If you don't, then you're probably not going to do well very well on my exam. Totally, totally. I remember those days. Um, <laughs> great. Well, uh, Santi is putting us in rooms. Um, when you, when you uh, get into your room with one another, super excited for uh, all you to collaborate a little bit. Um, is everyone feeling comfortable with the question? Everything makes sense? All right. Message. Um, oh, Nancy uh, had a. She said, "Do you collect preview pre-work?" Um, some of them I do. Some of them I make tickets to class, and they have to upload that pre-work. Like for example, those uh, nutrition meals that they're having to put together. Those are tickets to class. Um, I do some of the ATI activities. Their tickets to class. They have to go in and do and answer a bunch of questions and load that up into class. Because if they don't, they are not going to understand any of the meds or anything that I'm talking about. So uh, this is their way so that they make sure that they're staying with everybody else and they're fully able to engage with what's going on in the classroom. Great. All right. Um, all right. I think we are all set for uh, 
Uh, and we'll uh, we'll come back to some questions at the end, but uh, my colleague Vasanthi is ready to put us into a couple of rooms. So uh, yeah, when you uh, when you get there, get started, start collaborating. Yeah, I think we have. I think most people are back. Yeah. All right. So I want to know how it went. Um, what activities did you guys find that you used? And so maybe you can put one idea in the chat box that you're taking away with you today that you're going to be putting into practice this classroom because I'm really curious on which ones were the most appealing to everybody. Well, Alex will help me sort of feed that information out. Yeah, we have some great ones. So the storyboards and storytelling seem to be very popular. Uh, right. The mystery diagnosis, I can speak from experience. When Terry told me about mystery diagnosis, my mind was blown. I was an English teacher, not a nursing teacher, but I was, I'm just so blown away. So Terry, I don't know if you have anything you want to add about mystery diagnosis. How do students respond to it? Well, they are, they love it because they've really got to think it out and they have to make a story. Who is this client? And I always ask them, you know, um, what was his history? what could have been leading to this diagnosis once you've made up your mind about what this diagnosis is. So they've got to create a story and they've got to really think it through. Mm -hmm. And I ask them to think about, okay, well, what in your mind does this client look like? What's, you know, the skin integrity. And we talk about this in class. And so they, they, vis they end up visualizing this person and uh, it becomes real to them because they've made this person. And um, now they've got, now they're interested in saying, okay, well now let's take that person that you guys talked about in your group last week. And now, here's a new problem We've had, and here's some new information. Here's some new pictures. Now apply that to this case. So now they're thinking, oh, here's a complication. Well, what does that mean? What's my nursing, what does that diagnosis mean? What would my labs possibly be looking like? And so this really gets them to start putting things together that way. And, um, and they really like it. That's great. Uh, we see uh, creating an infographic as a summary tool from Sharon Flynn. Uh, Lori Goodstone mentioned meal planning for a renal patient. Uh, that was uh, another great one. So uh, yeah, lots of lots of love for mystery diagnosis and for storytelling, it looks like. Good. Yeah, well, that's great. Well, I'm glad to hear that that's going to be working for everybody. And again, take, take these ideas and um, have fun with them because uh, if you're enjoying what you're putting together with students, they're going to feed off your enthusiasm and um, be looking forward to what, what you're going to pull out of your hat next week in class in order to be able to give them some new ways of being able to start putting this stuff together. So as we move on here, if I can get my, my thing to be able to work. There we go. Amazing race to get clinicals. Um, this is, I think, some of the biggest concerns that we all have as educators right now is how in the heck are we getting get these students to meet uh, those magic number of clinical hours. In North Carolina, we're allowed 50% of our clinical time uh, to be simulation, I, you know, also vir virtual simulation. Um, but the biggest challenge that we have and that we started talking about since before even last semester ended was how do we get those 120 precepted hours that they need in order to be able to graduate? So that's been um, the big focus because we know that if we really don't get it at the beginning of the fall semester, we're afraid that may really jeopardize students being able to meet the Board of Nursing requirements to be able to graduate. So not all clinical rotations need to be in acute care. They need to be hands-on client care. Can we, do we want them in acute care if we can? Because that's what a lot of NCLEX is about. Absolutely. But sometimes we just need to be able to get them to be able to graduate. And I think that that's part of a lot of their biggest concerns, right, too, is how am I going to be able to get out the door here? Is my last year of nursing school really been messed up by COVID? So my story has been that, um, again, they, they graduated, my students graduated last year uh, because I, my community health is a preceptive course. And um, that gave them the hours that they needed with a little bit of time that they had uh, before everything was shut down at the end of March and they were no longer, the hospitals were no longer taking students and the, and the governor basically closed down the state. So that's how they, they were able to do it. So again, the pressure has been on me in order to be able to try and help working with my colleague who's also teaching obstetrics and pediatrics at the same time too. How are the two of us working in order to be able to get those students into precepted type of events um, so they were going to get those those 120 hours. So we had been working with a federally qualified health center. And um, we're also have and through them because they have a contract to work with Head Start. 
So we had a big meeting this morning and with our Head Start colleagues as well as our Federally Qualified Health Centre colleagues. And we've set it up so that we're going to have precepted as a precepted student and we're actually collaborating uh, with the Head Start with our education uh, colleagues as well too because they've got to be able to get their students out for precepted work so that they can meet their requirements to write their education and licensing exams. So this has been a collaborative work that we're doing with our education faculty. And um, so the, the education students and the nursing students are going to be working collaboratively in order to be able to go and do pediatric assessments. They're going to be helping with eyes and ear assessments. They're going to be following up when, when kids have been um, assessed off for uh, uh, speech therapy or having to do for learning disabilities. That's their responsibility to go back and track down those reports and talk to those those providers and get that information and then chart it um, we have also because there's quite a large uh, waiting list um, we're going to be working and using their programming uh, to and with faculties going along for the ride uh, going out and doing home visits with those kids on the waiting list as well too so we can start getting them prepared especially since there's just so much flux about where kids are being able to get into programs we want to make sure that a lot of these children and a lot of them are from um, are from English as a second language, a lot of Hispanic families. Uh, we wanna make sure that those kids are getting some of the English preparation to be able to walk into class as well too and be successful. So uh, we wanna make sure that the families have got nutrition. So we're building a lot of the community nursing health as well, along with our education colleagues doing a lot of their work in order to be able as a collaborative effort. Um, we're working with a children's home um the to, for students to be able to go and do preceptive work out there so i want faculty to start thinking outside the box we don't have to have everything in clinical has to be in acute care students uh, my nursing students are having to take what they learned in their acute care and now apply it in chronic health and they're learning a lot more about the management of chronic health and how to keep people out of that hospital in terms of looking at for discharge planning than they do with, by just staying in, in the acute care because they're seeing what they need to do and they're seeing what's happening in the homes. Um, I've taken a colleague with me because she's gonna be helping me out facilitating since we're trying to get so many more students out in community this semester and uh, gave her an idea about a client that's in my practice because I'm a faith community nurse. I have a practice that I, I have my own. And so I was taking her out to see some of my clients with me just to start getting her invested in community health. And, uh, and I told her, I said, now here's the client, here's where we're going to go see, and that's all I left it at. I didn't tell her anything else about this client because I wanted her to see what the students are going to feel when you walk in the door and you find out there's no food in the fridge and there's no food in the cupboards and that he's got no furniture in there. All he's got is a chair and a, a, a fold out table and uh, you know, but he doesn't understand his medications and he's got mac severe macular degeneration so that he has, uh, he's functionally uh, blind, uh, but he has no resources when it comes to that and say, okay, go. Now, what are you gonna do? And how are you gonna help these students learn through this? So she's, she came out of that experience with me last week going, okay, you know what? I'm gonna teach differently now because I really, I've heard about this but I've never seen this. And I, students need to understand how to better do discharge planning when they're coming home like this. I went, yay, because every nurse in my world needs to be a community nurse. So um, we can get students to learn an awful lot about how they're gonna get really good acute care by understanding what are the challenges in chronic care that, uh, in community care that get these people into that acute care bed. So think about, are there older meals, meals on wheels? Are there older adults that may require some nursing assessments that maybe they want to point you out that the, there are volunteers who drop off those, those meals. They're saying, you know, I'm really worried about this person because um, they're, they're taking so long to get to the door and I'm seeing clutter inside the house. And, you know, is there something that we should be doing? Going and doing an evaluation on this client, boys and girls clubs, children's homes. Um, if you're not using the schools, I know right now um, the schools are going to be going crazy because they're going to have to get all these assessments done in a very different way. And so they're, gonna, they're looking for the extra set of hands in order to be able to have nursing students and give them a hand with that kind of start. Again, Head Start programs, how can you be about, um, helping those individuals out um, as a nurse and looking at developmental stages of kids? Great way for, for them to be able to get those developmental components in their head for, for NCLEX. Primary care clinics, I've got students in urgent care. Um, as soon as we can try and get things back online where we've got working with our, our um, FQHC uh, partner, we want to be again, starting to do mobile clinics then for um, our Hispanic populations, our, our, our um, populations that are up here on visas. 
or as well as undocumented who may be living in the community so that way we're making sure that they're getting the health care that they need and we're creating that relationship between um, the with the clinics as well too so that they're actually not afraid that somebody's going to turn them into ice that this is the clinic that's designed in order to be able to try and help them with their health needs uh, group homes can again assessment for developmental or mental health uh, great ways of being able to go and talk to people just especially for junior students to learn them to get them those therapeutic communication skills. Can you be working with occupational health nurses? They're having to do a lot of, of checks on people. They're having to be able to teach individuals how to be able to provide safe uh, care to themselves to make sure that they're being able to maintain employment, but they're also not getting sick. So how can you work with them? Uh, again, I'm an American Red Cross nurse. Um, all my students are going through the disaster shelter tabletop scenario and then they can if that, that makes them qualified if you are in an area um, where you've got hurricane seasons or flooding or wildfires those students are able to go in and uh, assist as a, a, like a cna level but they're working under a nurse doing nurse uh, cna type of activities or some nursing activities if the nurse is willing to let them be able to do some things um, and that can get them some hours the pillowcase project is a great way of getting into the schools and helping these kids understand things like tornadoes and fires and uh, home fires and things like that. And so again, I've used that as a way of getting my students out um, in order to be able to get engaged in the school system in order to be able to teach children um, how to be able to look after themselves uh, when there is an urgent disaster or something else that's happening in the home. So these, I want you to start thinking about other ways besides just relying upon the hospital to get uh, those, those particular precious hours. Um, simulation of virtual simulations. Again, we have our simulation director has come down with very, very specific guidelines um, of how we're being able to do simulation. And, um, and so I'm having to completely rethink uh, the simulations that I had done. Actually, I've had to toss most of my simulations that I normally do because they involve students working together from a variety of different components on campus. Um, to do different things and then just not gonna be able to do that with social distancing. Um, so think about how you're gonna be able to reorganize your simulations that's gonna meet uh, the, the guidelines and whether or not, ask whether or not your healthier uh, simulation lab can meet a follow underneath um, a hospital type of environment, a healthcare environment, because if it is, then you may be able to reorganize with the college approval um, some of those, those social distancing requirements. Uh, and that's what we've done with ours is that because we're classified as a hospital grade, um, the, the, the state's already been to take a look and take us over if they, the hospitals start getting overwhelmed with COVID. So they've classified as hospital grade for us. So we've been able in order to be able to organize our simulations a little differently um, with our students in terms of social distancing requirements. Um, faculty also have a variety of virtual simulations available to them to use. ATI has got a lot of simulations that have, and they've come out and designed very specific clinical substitution. Um, methods that you can use for the substitution. F.A. Davis has a distance learning hub. It's open source. You do not have to be buying textbooks from them. Uh, reach out to your F.A. Davis um, uh, account representative and they'll give you distance learning hub for free. And again, it's got a ton of different types of um, simulations that you can be using mental health, uh, obstetrics, pediatrics, med surge, fundamentals, there's a variety, ton of stuff in there, which again uh, can be used in the classroom, again as uh, additional activities for students to be able to do as active learning strategies. Uh, if you've done some Nurse Tim stuff, Tim Bristol has got a really great simulation package if you want to purchase the subscription. Um, but it's got some, um, we used it when we were, had it for free because we were desperate for, for our, our um, critical care class of trying how we, what were we going to give students for critical care and he's got this emergency room which drove our students crazy because it's timed they're having to triage clients they're having to delegate it to the right level of nursing they're having to move people around in beds and they've only got this much time to be able to do it and they had to get 90 percent to be able to su successfully pass that component and get their points for that for that simulation. So um, there's some variety of different things out there that you can use. I just have to be able to talk with your publishers for this. 
Um, a plug for Ryerson University, they come out, they're in, based in Toronto. Um, they've come up with a simulation experience that's got med surge, pediatrics, obstetrics, mental health, emergency room opportunities in it. And again, there's the link for it. This again is another open access. And the med surge one is actually more leadership. It's talking a lot more about delegation. It's looking at nursing responsibilities at that leadership role. So I encourage you to take a look at that um, since it's open source, anybody can get into it and use it and incorporate it into the classroom or as again to as a virtual simulation activity. So breakout session again. Your faculty are worried about getting clinical time so students can graduate. So the plan is to upfront as much of those precious preceptive hours as possible. Thinking outside the box, what other community resources can you reach out to so that you can find preceptive opportunities? And the group can use a gerontology or a pediatric clinical to get started in trying to practice and think about how you want to do this. So think about your own community and what resources you have available that you have not even thought about tapping into to giving students experiential learning. So Alex, I'll let you take it away. Yeah, Vasanti is going to set that up uh, while you're, uh, there's one question that came in from Nancy. Uh, you mentioned Nurse Tim on the previous slide. Uh, is that a subscription for an institution or for an individual? It's per student. Okay, great. And they have it, you can take it for out for um, a, a year or two years. Awesome. Um, wonderful. So we are going to break off into our discussions again, talk uh, about some creative solutions around clinical. Um, we should be moving in a moment. There we go. Okay. So put your ideas in. I'd love to be able to hear what kind of things you came up with in the chat box. Um, I just want to follow up with some debriefing. And so I'll move through these slides really quickly. Uh, it's critical for us to debrief. I don't care if you're in the classroom, if you're doing the simulation, if you're in clinical, or if you are in virtual simulation. Those, all of those areas need to be have debriefing. This is how we're going to incorporate students in a safe place, sort of to be able to explore what they've uh, learned that day and help them, again, put that stuff together. Um, there's several different components of debriefing. Uh, when we're taking a look at uh, the learning strategies that we're going to be talking about, um, this again too is how your uh, students are going to be uh, identifying the issues that you want them to focus on, um, engage them on their learning, uh, reactions, how did they feel about this? What did they, did they get frustrated with trying to do something? So again, how did they get come across with this? And again, be, be perceptive about whether or not that conversation needs to be held with the student, if there needs to be more of a disciplinary action component of it. Um, the description is again, clarifying your facts, understanding what is the case that you're asking the students to talk about. In analysis, you're asking the students to do a self -an analysis. What did they, promoting that reflection, uh, what did they do? How was their own performance? As well as the faculty facilitating um, that analysis of getting probing deeper into key aspects. And then finally, the application. What are the takeaways? What are they learning from that component of things? Using of debriefing the didactic session. Um, this is only going to be as useful as the activity or the concepts that they should have applied. Make sure you're providing enough time at the end of class in order to be able to give them that debriefing. You're going to again be using those CAT uh, assessments where they can be doing peer-to-peer -peer evaluations using that audience response systems as well too. Um, debriefing in the clinical setting, there should be some kind of structured time and there's a variety of different techniques that you can be using. I won't go through this because of, of the amount of time that we have left, but there's lots of evidence on using different techniques or to be able to do the clinical debriefing. One of the challenges that we've run into is that all of our in-hospital uh, sites have told us that we're not allowed to debrief in the hospital anymore. And so my dean said, come up with a plan, figure out how we're going to deal with this. So we have put, I put together, um, asked the faculty to create uh, uh, their own class on Flipgrid. And the students are going to be given clinical activities as well as several debriefing questions. And the students are going to have to post a 10-minute video of themselves answering those questions and, and, and the debriefing component of it. And then we're asking students to respond in a video to two other students on their evaluation of what the students said in their debriefing and maybe offering some other ways of uh, things to think about or questions that they would have had for them. So again, this is the way we're, instead of getting them just to write things down, I've got to keep students engaged. So we're going to use Flipgrid um, as a method in order to be able to keep students um, invested in that debriefing process because it's so important for them to be able to uh, put those points together. 
virtual simulation. Um, you know, when we threw things together in, in the spring, I got to let everybody say, okay, well, we're not going to doing, um, doing uh, some type of debriefing, but I told all faculty, if you're doing virtual simulation, you must have a way of somehow, again, doing some kind of debriefing process. So again, using Flipgrid or pulling them together synchronously in order to be able to have a conversation and walk them through that process to make sure that they are putting the thoughts together. This is not use putting them onto a virtual simulation and then there's no feedback coming to them on why they didn't understand and why they why they were struggling to be able to put points together um, and then losing points on their on their simulation. So they need to be able to do it for virtual sim as well too. Thank you for being with me today. Um, there's my email address if you would like to contact me for anything or if there's any way I can help you. Uh, again, I'm happy to send you a copy of this presentation if that would be of any assistance to you. And for the last few minutes, Alex, do you have any other questions that you need that people want to have answers to? Yeah, so I, uh, if anyone has any questions, things that came up in the rooms that they wanted to talk more about, things that came up in the presentation that you wanted some clarity on, we had some great questions earlier, uh, feel free to, um, you could you could really just uh, jump in and un unmute yourself if you want, uh, or if you feel more comfortable, you can put it in the chat, I'm happy to communicate it, but yeah, it could be questions for, for, uh, for Terry, it could be questions for the room. Anyone? Give you a minute. The other, I, uh, um, I could also, uh, if, I, if everyone's interested, I could uh, share the link to uh, Terry has some awesome resources that she shared with the community on her uh, on her Coursera profile. So, Terry, is that okay if I share that? Absolutely. Yes. Awesome. This is a good um, about sharing stuff. Yes. So, uh, as I mentioned before, our uh, our nurse educator community seems to be the most active, uh, which is really really wonderful. Um, so, I'm going to. Uh, drop in the link to uh, Terry's profile here. And, and like I said, she, she shared some really, really great stuff that, uh, that might be of use to, to any of you. Um, we have another question from Nancy. She said, what do you do if a student doesn't, uh, doesn't uh, I think it doesn't turn in a ticket at, the, at class. Is that it, Nancy, or am I, am I getting it wrong? Well, if, I mean, if the student's not turning in their ticket to come into class, there's gonna be conversation. Um, and they need to understand uh, why these are requirements. Uh, and so that's a face-to-face -face conversation that I have with them. And I, you know, basically ask them, do, do you want to be successful in this course? Because there's going to be questions on this on the exam. Mm -hmm. And if you have not taken the time to be able to understand this material, you are not going to answer, be able to answer those questions and you're putting your ability to progress in the program at risk. So, I mean, the accountability has to be upon the student. It's not going to be on the faculty. So I, I want to make sure that the students understand that. Yeah. Um, also, I was in a room with Lori, and and Lori, I, I don't want to put you on the spot. You could, you could, you don't have to unmute. But I really loved your random picking. Uh, I don't know if you want to unmute for a second and tell people about that because I feel like that could work with the tickets at the beginning as well. Um, okay. <laughs> Sorry. <So Lori. laughs> We, uh, I've used a, um, a class preparedness quiz and they have a class preparedness quiz every class period. Um, but since we are, uh, we don't have a lot of points to spare and we don't give a lot of credit, you know, for just, you know, doing what we expect. Um, what I, what I do is at the end of the semester, close to the end of the semester, I have the Dean pull from a hat um, two random dates and those are the two quizzes that actually count and that you know it, it kind of gives them enough encouragement to be prepared for all of their quizzes because they never know which one is going to count and which one isn't. Great idea. Keep yeah. them on the ball. Yep. Yeah, I think I've also I've heard of someone doing like a hybrid where like they let the student pick one that they were really proud of and then like the rest were randomized or something. So like that, that's yeah, lots of different iterations, but I think that's that's awesome, awesome strategy. Um, Nancy asked, is the ticket a component in Blackboard or is it a physical thing? Well, I have uploaded like Word documents to them and that they can put down on their computer. Cause again, I do a lot of it with the pictures for their nutrition. They've got to be able to have those Word documents to be able to copy and then paste that onto another document, which has got space and the questions that they have to answer in regards to creating um, that nutritious meal for them. So, so it's depending on what you want to them to be able to do, but that's all loaded into our, our learning management system. 
Um, cool. I think we're at time. This may be the first session I've uh, met. Terry, you're a you're an expert. You're a pro if I know, but um, phenomenal. It was uh, such a wonderful joy to to meet all of you, um, to have all of you here. I, I really hope you enjoyed it. It was so wonderful to meet you. Um, I, I shared Terry's profile, her Coursera profile, the link there. I definitely encourage you checking it out. She shared some awesome resources on her profile. Uh, Terry, you have any final words for everyone? Um, thank you for being here. Best of luck to all of you. Uh, it's going to be a wild ride over the next few months, year. And again, if there's anything I can ever do to help anybody, please don't hesitate. Um, I'm happy to share anything that I've got that, uh, to um, help facilitate your students' success and you feeling comfortable and confident about engaging those students in your classroom. Thank you for the opportunity of being here. Wonderful. And we're uh, just to, to add to that, we're always looking for new ways to engage specifically the nurse educator community because they're so active on our platform. So at any point, please feel free to reach out to me as well. Um, and uh, yeah, you could just uh, reach out to educators at coursera.com. I am the educators behind that email. <laughs> I'm the one who answers those emails. So I would love to hear your ideas. But, uh, but thank you so much, Terry. It's always such a joy to work with you. Thank you so much, everyone, for being here. Uh, and we hope you enjoy uh, the rest of the summit. Take yeah, and you're, you're going to be able to put um, the link on uh, the chat then for everybody so that they can get hold of the presentation if they want. Yeah, so I, uh, I, so actually, so you and I could talk about that because there we just added a feature that you could actually add it to your profile so that people can click right there and just download it for you. Okay, so, all right. Yeah. If not, you had my email address or email Alex and he knows how to find me. Yeah. And I'm happy to share anything with you. Happy it. to make connections. Okay. Take all care, right. Everyone. Thank you, everybody. Have a great weekend. Oh, actually, Terry, we have one more question from Nancy came in. Uh, do you have okay. any recommendations for pharmacy teaching? Uh, for pharmacology? Oh, I mean, you can do those escape rooms. You could be, again, doing a lot of those different, even build some of those classroom assessment techniques and build it into um, activities in the classroom. Um, so you could have again mystery drugs kind of idea. What you know? What is this? What can you be using for this? Or is it combination of drugs? Uh, that would be managing heart failure or managing, you know, um, different types of disease categories or different things. So there's, you can, that mystery in a box kind of ideas can be used for a lot of different stuff. Great. Um, awesome. Great. Well, thanks so much again for everyone, for everyone uh, joining us and uh, hopefully we'll talk again soon. You're welcome. Okay, Take care.